So we're ready to get going with our next speaker, and I'd like to introduce Matt Van Sweden. He is from Integrated Architecture, and he is going to be talking about the Saginaw Chippewa, Chippewa Tribal College, a living learning laboratory. Um, so I think you are in for a wonderful um, both visual experience and um, looking and listening to what Matt has to say. So welcome, Matt. Thank you, Charlotte. <laughs> Um, I'm here fresh from an improv class at Kendall, so with that in mind, I'm going to not do any of this and just start talking to you about whatever. That's okay. Okay, that was a joke. I'm not really going to do that. <clears throat> so this project is an exciting project for me personally, but also for, I think, our community because it, it really is um, demonstrating a path to a different sort of built environment. and. Um, before I kind of get into it, I wanted to start with a quote from one of my favorite authors and thinkers. Uh, he's pretty local, well, national anyway, he's from Ohio. He works in Oberlin College. And uh, I read this quote about 10 years ago, and it really inspired me, really impacted me to kind of refocus um, my passions, what I'm devoting my energy into, and to really put it really simple, and I'll just read it because it's, it's pretty powerful. The plain fact is, is the planet does not need more successful people, but it does desperately need more placemakers, healers, restorers, storytellers, and lovers of every kind. It needs people who live well in their places. It needs people of moral courage willing to join the fight to make the world a more habitable and humane. And these qualities qualities have little to do with success as we defined it. Has anybody read David Orr, has seen this quote? Awesome, I'm not all alone, that's good. I would encourage all of you, if you take nothing else in from today, to go buy some of his books and start reading him. He is incredibly insightful, empowering, and just brilliant. So with that in mind, I want to tell you a story because we need more storytellers. Um, I'm going to give you a, a brief introduction to the Living Building Challenge, um, tell you some history of the, the project we worked on, and then I'm going to kind of break it down by imperative, and you may know more about that later, um, and kind of this project's approach to each of the 20 things that require to, to achieve a living building. So living building, um, it's inspirational, it's aspirational, but it's really um, just beautiful in the way in its simple approach. It's based off two rules. Uh, all imperatives are mandatory, so you have to meet all the imperatives, and there's 20 of them, as I said. Um, and there's not a percentage, you just need to get them all. And they're pretty straightforward and elegant in their approach, um, as you'll see, but that's the, the foundation is that you have to meet them all. And then it's based off actual performance, not um, prescriptive performance or prescriptive approaches in the, in the design process. It, it, you have to demonstrate you've met them by showing that you've actually done the thing you said you were going to do. And then um, kind of built under that, those two rules, it's, it's four, it's it changed a little bit since uh, we attempted the version of the Living Building Challenge at the time. But four main typologies, four main uses for the challenge, and it covers everything from buildings to neighborhoods down to like parks and like interior fit outs, small commercial interior fit outs. Uh, and then six transects. So transects are if you cut a city, cut a plane through the city, you kind of step back and you see a cross section. Um, and it, it kind of associates with different densities as you kind of approach an urban core. And the, the living building challenge recognizes that each kind of density or each transect uh, has different appropriate solutions or requirements for these 20 imperatives. So that's kind of why it's important to understand that we're in the kind of village or campus zone, so the um, transect three there. And that has just varying slightly different uh, requirements as you kind of go through this and you may pick up on some of that as I go through each imperative. And here they are, the 20 imperatives. So along the left you see the the petals, the categories that these 20 imperatives are kind of aligned into. On the top, you see the different scales, the typologies. 
and then on the right, um, the 20 imperatives that we'll be going through in a fair amount of detail. So um, deeply inherent in, in this, this living building challenge is the metaphor of the flower. So it, it thinks that nature should be our measuring stick um, on how we gauge success. So you'll, you'll kind of see, you know, the, the categories are called petals. Um, their logo is a flower. So it's, it's pretty kind of integral in that ecological literacy that David Orr speaks to, um, but also the, the kind of understanding that nature is already doing what we are trying to do. All we gotta do is try to mimic it or try to figure out how it's doing what it's doing. This slide is not propaganda, although it kind of is a little bit. But this is um, the main thing of the presentation. It wasn't me, I didn't solve this problem, I didn't solve this challenge. Uh, it wasn't integrated architecture. It was a team. Um, and the thing I wanna leave you with is, is the challenges we have to face aren't challenges we can do alone, we have to do them together. And, and the crucial to the success of this project was this team. Not that it was this team, but it was a team and it was a a team of individuals that were like-minded that are, were all kind of working towards the same goal, had the same goal in mind. Um, and so we had not just in the conceptual design world of architecture, typically you have an architect, designer, an owner, and that's about it. Sometimes you'll bring in mechanical engineers, civil landscapers, but in the conceptual phase, it's usually just a design team working with the client. Um, we kind of went away from that and we engaged a whole group of individuals from the start. Uh, so we had uh, hydrologists, people who understand how water flows in and around a site. We had um, native landscapers. We had a farmer, um, which you'll hear more from later, Levi, he's a great guy. Uh, we had commissioning agents helping us develop what the owner's project requirement should be. We had a team of engineers and material research folks, so from three different firms, all focusing different parts of the material aspect of the, the living building challenge. But then we also had um, integrated, we, we were there, and uh, Rockford Construction helped with pre-construction services. So I, I'm kind of staying on this for a little bit just because I, I don't want to belittle this or beat a dead horse, but this was, it was pretty integral to, to the project. So all these, these team members were working together on all parts, almost all parts of the Living Building Challenge. It wasn't just one group working in isolation on one thing. We were all constantly engaging each other and, and working with um, each other. And, and to kind of illustrate that, on the top right here, you'll see those little dots. Those kind of represent, and you'll see it per imperative grower kind of come back, the amount of collaboration that this graphic took, right? Um, so the first imperative is uh, the limits to growth, and that's pretty familiar with what we're familiar with lead. So you can't develop on um, prime farmland, you can't develop within a floodplain, you can't develop on um, previously undeveloped greenfield sites. So we mapped out all those different things, and we the gray area. I can do this. Nope. Oops. Hold on. The gray area represents um, the buildable land per the challenge. So we kind of talked with our uh, civil engineers and we kind of got an idea using some survey data to figure out where we could build. And the gray area is kind of where we, we've identified that where we could build. And ultimately the, the project landed down here, as you can see by some of the graphics. Urban agriculture, um, this started out as just a line item in the living building challenge, right? You have to grow some of your own food. But what that meant for our team uh, grew exponentially as we kind of dove into that and really kind of explored what that means. We need 35% of our campus dedicated to growing food. And when you have 46 acres, that's a lot of land to be dedicated to growing food. That's not 20 raised beds, that's not an orchard, that's significant infrastructure. And so um, with some foresight, foresight, I kind of asked a farmer friend to kind of come help us understand that. And this whole portion of the, the project, this backside, is our agriculture um, components, about 10 acres. So we had to think about a barn. We had implements we needed. We had grain storage. We, had, um, we wanted a classroom in that barn space that 
that we could kind of educate and engage students with this, this agriculture experience. Uh, we needed a place for our laborers to spend the night because our farmer said, if you're not close to your farm, you're not going to get at it, access to it enough um, that the farm would require. So we kind of built in all the stuff uh, into the program while kind of discovering what it meant for this living building challenge. The next uh, site imperative is habitat exchange. So this is pretty straightforward. It, you know, they say you can't build on green fields, um, which is understandable. But they also then say, if you're developing on previously developed land, you need to set aside an equitable size into perpetuity in a land trust so that future generations can have access to um, wilderness, to uh, forest, to you know, the natural beauty that is around us. And remember, we're already developing on land that's already previously developed. So this is the restorative mindset. This is taking something, reclaiming it, making it better, but then also taking some additional space and saving that for the future too. So the project budget included about $100,000 to, to put some land and some trust. Car-free living, this is the next and last imperative of the site um, pedal. It requires us to look um, for opportunities to encourage car-free living. It's, it's pretty implied in the title. Um, there's two main ways of doing this. You have to look at the region and its context and try to figure out how you get people to and from your site without needs of transportation. But we're in a kind of a smaller city without a whole lot of infrastructure. But there was this, this pink magenta path that's a future planned non-motorized trail network that goes all around Mountain Pleasant that bisects our site. So we realized that and we wanted to encourage and incorporate that into our final plan. But it also requires each project not to kind of tip the scale of um, a type of development. So they didn't want all residential houses in a catchment area, which is the larger kind of context of the project that it sits in. They didn't want a single use to occupy and demand all of the resources that are in that, that catchment area. So it required teams to kind of make sure that they weren't tipping that scale. And in the, in the technical manual for the challenge, it kind of demonstrates what percentages they are. But we are pretty safe. Um, we, there aren't a whole lot of academic buildings in the, in the region, so we were pretty safe. But kind of taking that, that methodology, that mindset, um, we really explored how do people get to the site? Um, how do they get around? We really kind of, the, the vehicular transportation infrastructure is actually secondary to non-motorized. So um, bike, separated bike paths, pedestrian lanes, lots of pauses. Um, the whole, the hierarchy of getting around this is geared towards the pedestrian. And you can see here's that, that non-motorized path that's gonna kind of come through our site. Uh, some of these are, aren't graphically stimulating, they're kind of boring to look at, um, but they're exciting to think about. Uh, this is one of them. This is the net water, net positive water requirement. So the imperative is you have to capture and, and use um, for your needs recycled, treated, or fallen rainwater. And so that focused our attention on lowering the demand. So what can we do? We use composting toilets, uh, really low flow urinals. We're collecting rainwater off the roof. We're storing it in cisterns that are sized. Um, to meet our needs based off our annual rainfall. Um, we have a, a reclamation system that's capturing and treating our affluents, our black water, and reincorporating it into the water system. We have a whole building um, water system, water filtration system. So it really was um, integral to the project. And then when you think about agriculture and the demands of irrigation, what do you do with that? Uh, and so we actually had a daylighting or so we had a county drain running through the site. And if I go back a slide, so this, there's a county drain, it's about 52 inches of diameter that goes through the site. It's buried. Um, our solution was to dam it, to, to daylight it, which means we're going to dig up that pipe, we're going to break it up, and we're going to incorporate a naturalized stream through the site. Uh, and that the pond is actually going to help us with our agriculture needs. And so we're, we're taking a, a, a system that is Pretty straightforward, right? It moves water from one place to another, and we're kind of pausing it, 
we're using, utilizing it, but then we're also downstream, we're making it cleaner than it would have normally been because we're incorporating infiltration. So a lot of the, the soils and in, in, uh, the strata that the water will fall into recharge the aquifer is gonna be cleaning the water as well as um, acting as a, a container for it. And then um, the second requirement for the water pedal is we had to match um, the historical naturalized water flows of the site. So we had to look at topography. We had to understand how water flowed through the site. We couldn't disrupt that and we couldn't discharge more water than um, historically would have been. So when we think about the kind of vegetation that was here pre-colonialism, we had to match that. So we had to understand that. Um, and then we had to design a system, which you saw here, that emulates that. And here's the infrastructure that is providing that. So we're, we're um, taking stormwater, we're, we're capturing and, and putting rainwater in cisterns. Um, it, it just kind of, this is, again, not a very exciting graphic, but it demonstrates the, the complexity of our system, water system, to make sure that we're emulating the natural hydrology of um, pre-development events. Uh, the next one is, is sometimes the most exciting to talk about because there's a lot into this and it seems like the energy pedal, kind of feel bad for it, it's only got one, one imperative, but it's a big one, um, net zero energy. And right from the beginning, our engineers said, here's the hierarchy that we need to utilize when we're thinking about getting to net zero. We can't just buy a bunch of infrastructure and create um, energy that is producing as much energy as kind of business as usual. We had to really think about low demand, so we need to get that off the base and improve it. And then once we kind of cut out all the kind of unnecessarily expenses, the vampire wattages from our electronics and devices and things like that, we had to think about high efficiency systems and equipment. And only then, once we kind of built, took out of the demand side and we built in high efficiency, could we kind of think about approaching uh, net zero from a um, production standpoint. So what do we do? We, we started challenging assumptions about do we need conditioned air all the time? Can we utilize natural ventilation? So that's what we did. Uh, we found out 20% of the day, 20% of the year can be met with just natural ventilation. So we're gonna use that um, to lower our demand for energy. And then we looked at indigenous knowledge. How, do, how did the uh, indigenous peoples condition their spaces? Um, what was their what knowledge base did they have? And uh, this was so impactful to the design um, that it warrants a full slide, I promise. Um, what they did is they, they have a, a skin that's adaptive to the climate. You know, we're in Michigan. They were Michigan, it was the same Michigan weather. <laughs> they did the same things we try to do with our buildings. So how could we emulate that? Um, and what was really interesting is they used thermal mass. They buried rocks underneath the fireplace um, over top of reeds that were buried and they brought in air to kind of create the chimney effect that you see. So when it allows oxygen to get in and kind of evacuate while storing that, that heat in the rocks below. And then they would sleep on top of those warmed rocks. Um, the east entry is, is kind of referencing the, the predominant wind out of the west. Um, and that actually has some, some religious context associated as well, but it's mostly a practical thing. They don't want wind blowing right into their dwelling units. So on the left, you see the kind of the, a preliminary study of how we could emulate that. So we have a roof that kind of comes down, becomes a wall. We have a base that kind of rises up, um, and we're using thermal storage and thermal distribution in a, a radiant system, radiant floor slab slit system. But before we went there, we wanted to study it to make sure it was appropriate. We, we didn't want to just jump to where we thought the most appropriate solution would be. We wanted to make sure we did all the analysis that we, we, we could. So we looked at different orientations, different shapes, different massings, um, each giving a different kind of what we refer to as a UI, energy use intensity. It's a measurement, um, kilo BTUs per square foot per year. And the lower we can go, and 20 was our target, um, most buildings are between 80 and 100 
So a building that's using about a quarter of what is traditional or typical was our goal. And so we did a lot of energy analysis. We did a bunch of different systems. Um, we did these eight. Again, that's kind of where we landed. And associated with each of these, we, we performed thermal comfort analysis, which system provided the most thermal, the tightest thermal range um, of comfort that we could provide in, at the lowest energy use and ended up being the radiant floor system. And here we're looking at all these different systems, um, different options, different mechanical systems, uh, different fenestration options, different um, kind of envelope thermal performance all giving us different UI numbers, slightly so, um, but they all have some variant of, of different, and you can see they're all right around that 20, right? And this was the ultimate one we went with, which is 19.1. And these are some massing studies. We looked at separating some uses, uh, the gym, the higher functioning spaces, um, apart from the main academic space, different kind of clustering orientations, uh, and this one was the one we ultimately went with, the long, skinny rectangle. And this was ultimately our, our solution. So we have a geothermal storage paired with, excuse me, um, PV on the roof. We have uh, solar, or it's not solar, we have solar thermal collectors, and we have um, wind turbines. And then we're using active chilled beams and radiant floor heat distribution. And then the, the air, the very VAVHU, which is to, to kind of maintain the um, outside air requirements per code. And here was just a study of, of where we we're going to put our turbines. You know, how big are they? What do they look like in context? We kind of associated um, both hinting at some of the farmland preservation activities. Yes, David. Um, you're putting wind turbines on this. Yes. It, it, it's not the greatest, um, but it, it wasn't just because it was the most economical way of doing it. There's a couple reasons why we did it, both from an advocacy standpoint, why not have this conversation? Um, and we, we needed to get high, so we didn't do this, the shallower ones, the 30 foot. We went, we went 100 feet in the air, right? And that's where the most constant wind is. So. We're not the best performer, but we're also not the worst. We're kind of right in the middle. Um, and so it, it did hurt our efficiency, but not significantly so. But we also looked to Germany, because Germany has um, some of the most um, highest percentages of renewable energy production. And their climate is actually more cloudy and colder than ours. So if they can do it, the, the assumption is, so can we. And they, they kind of matched. Um, wind turbines with photovoltaics because they, they complement each other. So in the winter time, wind turbines peak, and then in the summertime they kind of dip, and then they peak up in the winter again. Um, solar collection is actually the inverse. It, it declines significantly in the, the winter and it peaks in the summer. So with those divergent peaks at different parts of the season, we have a, actually a, a better year-round production so we could lower our battery capacity um, and actually have more re re reliant and resilient energy production. And as I was saying, farmland preservation is oftentimes with, often paired with um, wind turbines because you can't develop in the fall range of these turbines. And so we thought if we're going to put farmland up, we might as well make sure they can't develop it into the future. So why don't we, why don't we put turbines up there to protect that into perpetuity? So the next um, series, this is um, health, the health pedal. And this is one of the most prescriptive requirements um, associated, so they're not all that fascinating. The civilized environments just require um, humane spaces to work in, essentially. But their, their kind of technical requirement is that each occupiable space needs to have access to operable windows. Um, and, and kind of. Figuring out the solution to that, we recognized, realized we need to incorporate a courtyard so that both sides of this um, faculty space could have access to um, operable windows. 
And so how did that, I mean, that's obviously increasing our um, envelope surface area, so it's increasing how much thermal loss we get in thermal heat we get in uh, um, winter and summer. So how can we optimize that? And we explored covering that courtyard, treating it as a greenhouse to really both enhance how natural ventilation works by creating a superheated space at the top to draw air through it, utilizing the stack effect, um, to also then close it in the winter time to semi-heat that space. So the difference between that courtyard and the adjacent spaces is, is less than the outside space. And so we were able to reduce the, the, the curtain wall in that courtyard to a double pane from down from a triple pane. That's around the entire other perimeter, which is a cost saving um, endeavor. And this also uh, reduced the energy production or energy needed by about 10%. So it's just one of those solutions to be explored to kind of figure out how to you know, meet all these different competing imperatives um, in a comprehensive solution. And this one by far is the most boring slide. Sorry, not only are you looking at a really gross filter, but the, the <laughs> The imperative is the most prescriptive. It just says you need to do air testing. You have to have adequate filtration in your systems. Um, it's more akin to um, what you're probably familiar with, IEQ credit five in the lead rating system. So it just kind of sets out, these are the things you need to do, and here's how you need to do them. So there isn't a whole lot of excitement going around uh, on performing that, but we did make sure we met it. This one, though, biophilia. Speaking to David Orr earlier, right, ecological literacy, this is pretty cru crucial to the design. And uh, what it required is every 20,000 square feet, you needed to have one of each of the six biophilic design elements incorporated into your design. So we're north of 60,000, so we needed three of each. So a total of 18 biophilic design elements incorporated into our design. And we didn't get to the point where we, were, we knew exactly what we were doing. We were just looking for inspiration. Um, so what we did is we put together kind of a mood board, if you will, of different um, inspiring or, or motives that we were looking at per each biophilic um, design principle. Do, do we, I guess I should ask, do, do we know what biophilia is? All right, great, some of you know. Uh, biophilia is the kind of the philosophy that um, says that we as humans are inherently drawn towards nature and that we have a biophysical reaction to that. So um, we heal faster, we learn better, we can infer nonverbals better between humans. So basically it's saying our, we are at our healthiest, most vibrant selves when we're in close proximity to nature. So the built environment is kind of doing us a disservice because it's putting up barriers, putting us in boxes essentially. And we're kind of seeing some of the psychological ramifications of that throughout the course of our kind of history. So this is requiring kind of the opposite end of that, incorporating more nature into these conditioned spaces. Um, so we're just kind of looking at, uh, and I'm gonna go through these in pretty quickly, but the, visually the, the idea is that we want to get some of these, some environmental features, and in bold you hear, you see the ones that we're actually trying to engage with. Um, both because we thought it was appropriate for this particular client, fire being a pretty significant um, cultural iconic sort of idea in for the tribe, um, and just because it was also interesting. So the six design principles are, like I said, environmental features, uh, natural shapes and forms, um, natural patterns and processes, kind of playing with light and space, evolved human nature relationships, and then place-based relationships. This was a really fun exercise because you're not often able to kind of explore biophilic design principles in some of our more commercial designs. So we kind of looked at this and like, what can we celebrate? Um, how can we do things on the site, on the building differently than we would have and how can we celebrate this connection that we have as humans to the na natural environment? Um, then the next pedal is the materials pedal. And uh, again, these aren't all that exciting, but there was an incredible amount of thought that went into this because th this is kind of dubbed the, the hardest, most difficult pedal of all the challenge. Because the industry that produces the materials that we build our buildings out of 
is not transparent at all. So getting at their information, finding the information that we need was incredibly difficult. That's why we kind of hired three teams to kind of tackle the, these five imperatives. Um, the first imperative is red list. So it has a, a list of uh, 19 chemical families representing, I think, about 800 different types, actual chemicals that you can't incorporate into your building. That's very difficult because most, when you call up the phone and be like, hey, do you have any something? What's that? No, I don't know what that is. And so the, the, the opaque market is really kind of the imperative or the, the, the main impetus to, to kind of adapting this red list challenge. But it, it is a good thought process to think about the toxicity of these chemicals and how they negatively affect us as people. Yep, so there's the de declare product um, page where some products have gone through that process. Some manufacturers have said and gone through this, this vetting process and done some of the research. But because this is such a kind of advanced rating system, there aren't a whole lot of, not every um, product manufacturer has done that. And it's, it's hardly com comprehensive. It's, it's pretty limited at this point, but the idea is you're engaging in a, a pretty sizable industry and in requiring transparency. And that's kind of like the, one of the main pieces of this, this requirement. The next one is embodied carbon footprint. So we had to think about the life cycle of all the products that we use. Uh, and we have to think about proximity to the site. And because obviously the heavier, more dense things that are further away uh, take more energy to get to site. So we had to kind of think of um, what materials can we utilize that have the lowest embodied carbon footprint and then at the end of the, the construction uh, after it's all done you have to kind of do a life cycle analysis of the entire process from start to finish and offset your your carbon emissions for that so our budget based off um, some averages of other living building teams that they've seen we establish about almost a quarter million dollars to, to have a one-time offset of our construction and design related um, carbon offset or carbon emissions. Responsible industry. I think a lot of us are familiar with FSC certified wood. Uh, there are other sort of res uh, industry specific certification tools that are out there. And this is just requiring project teams to engage and utilize um, products from industries that have these standards. And if they don't, we have to advocate that they do and create them. Appropriate sourcing. This was fun and an interesting imperative because it's all about local economy and, and making sure you're doing, you're building with what you have available to you. So we had this huge 30 foot dirt pile that was basically the, the casino was up here. And when they were um, excavating that site, they just dumped all their dirt here. Um, and we thought, that's interesting. Not only is that ugly, um, but what can we do with that? So we, we were thinking of ways we can mine that. And so we were including a rammed earth wall in our design and we're using um, pressed earth blocks for structural components for load bearing walls on the inside of the building. And the idea is that those both things are gonna be mined in part or to great extent from that dirt pile. And then we also looked at salvage shops. So we created a map of all the different salvage shops in the country or in the state and figured out what they had. And we didn't get to the point where we're calling them and buying stuff, but we, we created a database and what they have for the project team to utilize into the future um, if this goes forward. And then um, conservation reuse. So not only do we have to think about um, construction waste, but we also have to think about design for deconstruction. So is anybody familiar with that term, design for deconstruction? It's designing in a way that makes the thing easier to take apart um, once the, the usable function of the product is done. So think screws versus glues, um, just things that when you put it together, you can take it apart easier and then you, you're not damaging that product. You can take it and reuse it somewhere else. Um, so you're thinking of the whole life cycle of the product and trying to get at ways that you can maximize the, the value of, of a product you, you buy uh, initially for a project. 
Um, and then uh, I have a few slides on how we approach this particular series of, of um, pedal or imperatives because it, it took a team. There's three disparate teams working together. So they created a, what they call a, a material principles. You know, they, we want to look at products that had multiple benefits so it wasn't just a wall, um, like a drywall that you have to paint, coat, et cetera. It was something that could put up and be utilized for structure but also kind of left unfinished and be beautiful in its own right. Uh, we wanted materials that were of the earth. Uh, as I said, kind of playing off the first one, simplify, uh, limit finishes, utilize natural materials, and utilize salvage materials where possible. And this was kind of a flow diagram of all the different sort of five material um, imperatives and how to kind of get at. So we didn't want to have every product selection filtered through an entity. We wanted to equip the team on, on ways that get them to make the most appropriate selection. And then we have a whole kind of guidance document that's a part of the, the, that was a part of the project that kind of asks specific questions to, like I said, equip a team to get at what's the most appropriate solution. Uh, the next two, the last two imperatives are really interesting because they're fairly unique. Um, this has to do with equity, so like social equity, um, democracy, things of that nature, and then the last one is beauty. And those, those are um, hard to quantify, hard to put into like a standard, um, and that we understood that, but so there's some gray area in how to best approach these different kind of intangible um, goals. But the first one is, is human scale and humane places, kind of pairing off the civilized environment one. It requires project teams to think about the human that's going to be experiencing that. And maybe that's inherent in some of the design processes that some architects go through, um, but not so much in the engineering side. So we had to think about the appropriate width of, of a driveway and how much parking you can cluster together before you need to break it with vegetation. You need to think about the, the building itself, how much of a blank, opaque wall surface can you have before you need to kind of break it apart with fenestration and, and kind of getting some transparency within the, the shell of the building. Think about how many functional uses you can have apart from how, how far they apart, just so to kind of get at how do humans use the facility, how do they, um, what's the most appropriate scale. And so there's just some metrics that, that our team um, worked through to, to make sure that we, we hit all of those. And here's some cross sections of the site to kind of get at the scale of the different solutions and appropriate uh, in their relationship to each other and how they scale to, to how a human experiences it. Democracy and social justice. Um, this basically says you can't design any part of the site that can't be um, enjoyed by all users, all people at all times. So no gated communities, no homeless spikes to get people to not lay in the street. Um, and thinking about ADA accessibility. So our site was pretty flat, but we were very sure that um, our grades were designed in such a way that people in wheelchairs and, and crutches, and um, they were designed not just for the physically healthy people, but all of the whole range of the human um, condition. And, and on to that point, point, like one of the things that um, is most limiting to people when you're thinking about walkability, even in ur urban environments, is diversity of seating options. So when you're young, you may not worry about walking a mile and a half, two miles, three miles. Uh, but if you have impairments or you're elderly or you're, maybe you're not in the greatest shape, maybe you don't want to go two miles before you can sit down. And so they won't even go on those journeys because they don't know if they can make it. So we're very clear and it, it was a conscious choice to make sure that we have lots of touch points, lots of places just to sit and be within the site and the, the hope that, and research will, will kind of confirm this, that that site will then be more utilized by more people because it is more inclusive. And then rights to nature. Um, we have a pond on site, we're daylighting a stream, we're uh, naturalizing the landscape. We're really in a lot of ways making this a very pleasant, beautiful space. This imperative requires that you can't limit access to nature um, by design, either through not making a, a ramp that's accessible by wheelchair or um, limiting daylight 
so access to sun on adjacent properties. And this one wasn't so big for this context, but if you think in urban environments, the idea is you can't just block the sky, you can't block the sun from your neighbors. Um, and so with this, we just make sure that our whole site is inclusive and um, provides equal opportunity for everybody to, to enjoy, kind of in dovetail with the previous imperative. And the last two, beauty and spirit. Um, thinking about challenging the assumption that everything has to be utilitarian. Uti uti my goodness. Yes, thank you. Um, everything has to be utilized to its greatest um, potential. The, the, the inherent in this imperative is that there has to be something in the site that's designed specifically for human delight. It can't serve no other function. It just has to be there just because it's beautiful. Um, and that's it. And, and what it is, how it is, the, and don't even get me started on the objecti objectivity of, of, and subjectivity of what is beautiful. But uh, we tried to design something um, that was just there to, to experience and delight. The last one, inspiration education. This is an educational facility for the Saginaw Tribal Indian Tribe. They're, they're kind of community college, the tribal college. So how fitting is it that the imperative requires us to inspire education? And um, I have the, the guiding principles the team developed early in the process as, as a way of navigating through all the challenges of the living building. And this was pretty crucial to the, the project because it was more restrictive than the living building challenge was itself. It's based off uh, their history, their their um, creation story. Uh, the seven grandfathers are what you see on the left, and I'm not even going to attempt to say their names because th I'm not going to. But what the rough translation is on the, on the right of that line, wisdom, love, respect, bravery, honesty, humility, and truth. That's what we had to design. That's how we approached it. Um, and so not every op available design option fits within that construct. So it was a really good way of weeding out bad things that weren't appropriate, but it also was a incredibly challenging to the design team to try to figure out solutions that met all of those. Um, and on the far right, what you see are taglines that kind of emerge out of this guiding um, principle session that we had. That was the first thing we did as a design team. We got a history lesson from the tribe, tribal historians, and then we established these guiding principles. And so. What the team decided we needed to do is we needed to inspire learning. We needed to, need to serve the seventh generation. So our great, 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 great grandkids, right? Um, think about that. 20 years roughly to a generation, to 140 years from now, thinking about the impact of this building, this project, this, this location has in 120, 140 years. Um, be restorative, earn the right to occupy the land, uh, that kind of is, is born out of an indigenous sort of feeling that we don't own this land. We're just occupying it for a time. We're just borrowing it. So there's kind of this, this dignity and honor of, of earning that right to be here, to kind of occupy this land, to take resources for our benefit. Be authentic. Um, take only what you need. And then kind of really understand that everything is connected. We, we don't live in isolation. We live in connection in, in a lot of different ways. So. We try to do that as best we could. And that's, that's it, guys. That's all 20 imperatives. Um, and I think I left to try to leave some time for, for questions, if there are any. Yes. Yeah, um, this isn't probably the best client to talk about. I mean, it is and it isn't, right? So we were never tasked with a budget. We just said, we want you to design a concept that meets the living building challenge. So professionally, we were obviously aware of budget impacts of different solutions, but we weren't ever charged or put to task, I guess. We just kind of developed a solution that they wanted, they asked for. Um, and this is a tribe, it's, it's associated with a casino, and that's kind of how they, they operate. That is their funding mechanism. Um, but they, they're trying to get away from that. So how do you get into a living economy where the tribe is resilient and self um, supporting, and this is kind of a way that they see of doing that, of getting um, their tribal youth into an education that kind of inspires a deeper learning 
deeper understanding, investing into the future, um, you know, jobs, trainings, et cetera. So th this is, uh, this project was about $370 per square foot, but you have to understand we're impacting 46 acres. We're developing about a $5 million farm, 10 acre farm. Um, we're doing lots of things that aren't always required per the living building challenge. So it's a little bit more on the expensive end. Um, but the goal was, wasn't to design a cost-effective solution. It was to design the most um, appropriate solution. That's a great question, and it was a point of great conflict with our design team, uh, and mostly me, because I like to push boundaries. But uh, you're right, we have far less parking spaces than would be required by code. Um, but the tribe, being a sovereign nation, isn't really doesn't, doesn't, it doesn't in fact impact them. So we had to put to case that how we designed the parking spaces, the number we came up with, why that's appropriate. And how do you get people to the site? How do you share resources? Um, how do you encourage more car-free living? Uh, and so that was, a, that was a very lively conversation. Um, per the, the Living Building Challenge, we were only technically around about 26 parking spaces. So we, we pushed that institution. I mean, the Living Building Challenge is inherently an advocacy tool, so we're not only advocating into the community, we're advocating to back to the authors of this challenge, saying what's really appropriate in this rural setting for a tribal college. I mean, clearly we need more than 20 parking spaces, but maybe we don't need 300, you know? So we're, we're trying to find that balance, and how do we get people to visit the site without their cars? Um, and like, again, long-term visioning, do we need to develop um, tribal infrastructure alternate transportation options, um, ways of getting people, car sharing, et cetera, to the site that doesn't require them to drive their unique um, vehicles to the site. Did I answer your question? Okay. Uh, I took out a slide in, in, the, in the hopes of saving some time, but it's, uh, it's still in conceptual development. Um, we, they had, there's, there's politics in tribal organizations as much as there are in European organizations such as ours. Uh, so we had to kind of wait on, on some resolution and, and we're still working on getting the, the project approved. We had a meeting with a, the new tribal council that was elected last fall, this beginning of this year. And so we're working on ways in which we can either phase it, do some cost saving exercises, um, or invite other uh, tribal programs to be a part of the, the project so they can plug in to kind of reduce the burden per program, if that makes sense. So it's not built. We went through design exercise, but we're, we're still working on it. We're still optimistic that it's going to move forward and we're going to build a living building. It's a good question. It's a tricky question. Um, they exempt FF&E from that particular requirement because they recognize a lot of the chairs, a lot of the lighting fixtures, are, they have PVC in them. So until the industry provides solutions that don't have PVC, that exception will remain there. But from like a kind of core structural material component, none of your components can contain PVC. None of your wall finishings, none of your um, floor finishings, trim, that, can't, that can all be PVC free. So it's kind of like, yes, both. It's, it's not going to have any, and it's probably going to have a little bit. So a lot of our tubing, would, we'd have to explore options that didn't have PVC in them. So HDPE, um, other sort of alternatives to the PVC. It took four months from when we first met to when we, five months, to when we developed the kind of a, it was about a 50% DD package. I don't know if you're familiar with that. What schematic design is, it's usually just elevations um, plans and site. So we did sections, we did a lot of additional uh, mechanical design, so it was a little bit more involved than that. But from start to finish, it took about five months, which was a lot. To, it was very compressed. And um, we had that initial full day kickoff meeting. We had um, the whole SCTC building committee. We had the border regions there. We had student um, group liaisons there and so we also did before we launched this part of the exercise was a program exercise to figure out what sort of spaces we need to inc include in the in the design and so that had 
work sessions with student groups, faculty, tribal members, on our like from our team, just kind of getting their their feedback. But throughout the process, one of the things they said in the initial meeting was, "You have to, we have to design by consensus." So we couldn't do anything unless we made the case, and the tribal council said, "Yes, this is we we are comfortable with this." And so we had a series of um, meetings with them to check in with the team, have progress. Uh, we had like a 50% pedal check-in meeting over the course of two days where we just kind of went through our whole process and progress to date. Uh, we, our firm, had regular by about monthly sort of touch points with the client saying what we're doing, you know, we explored options. It was actually, I mean, I'm showing you the kind of end result. The process to get there was, was sizable as well. So, but there was there was intentional points where we we needed to connect because building designing by consensus isn't easy. Um, it's the most inefficient way of doing things. So, to, to do that in a four month time frame was 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 a challenge. But it goes back to the team. I mean, that's the whole team kind of stepped up, and we we didn't really have to make a whole lot of hard sells to the client because a lot of the methodology, the research, the the um, professional best practice practices were kind of leading us to what would be the most appropriate solution. Okay. So I think maybe one more question. It was a very typical project delivery. So the tribal college put out an RFP we responded to at the time they wanted a net zero capable building. Um, our team reach out to them, kind of quarter them as you would typically interviewed. We got selected. Um, part of the, 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 the proposal was to provide a day charrette on how to achieve net zero. And instead of that, we invited them to a day work session on the living building challenge. And since that, they kind of said, well, we just wanted net zero because we thought that was the best we could do, but this is obviously more. So it was, it was a very typical delivery mechanism and we were just kind of fortunate stars aligned and, and we got the right client and cast the right vision. Thank you very much. Thank you.